There is no doubt that I have discovered the ultimate in stagnant human societies. The Bikira have realized the human dream of immortality and have paid for it with their humanity and their immortal souls. Welcome back to the Rain of Books podcast, where the written page reigns supreme. This is the reader's entry into great narratives. I'm John Keel, joining you from the War Room. My co-host is Josh Preston, joining you from the Hyrule Cube. And uh, Josh, I have to say, this podcast, or this book rather, is exactly why we do this podcast. Epic, epic, epic. I'm excited to talk about this one. And um, just a quick note here at the beginning, this book is so exciting and there's so much content we're probably going to rush through the news a little bit, so uh, we're not we're not going to linger much discussing the news topics. Josh, how are you doing? Hey, John, I'm doing pretty good, and you are not wrong, sir, because this is absolutely epic. I was I couldn't sit here and figure out where to start in the book because, as you described it earlier, this is hardcore science fiction, and I would say I won't comp- make this apples to apples comparison, but I will say that this is uh, Game of Thrones in uh, respect to the fact that how real and how brutal this uh, this future in the stars uh, is for mankind and about the, uh, I guess, re- re- real pain and suffering that we carry with us out into uh, these 150 other worlds that we have conquered. Uh, because man, man is still the dominant sentient species in the universe. And it is, it is a very good story. It's a Hugo Award-winning book by Dan Simmons. And... Uh, the beginning quote was a, a, a kind of uh, motif about immortality, about time, because time is, is played out in very many different ways in this book. It's, it's a really engrossing read, and I am pumped. But before we get to it, we'll start with the news, John. And the first news story is a little quick read about um, what we've touched on earlier, about publishers uh, warming up to fan fiction. We talked about Amazon Worlds, which is Kindle's uh, attempt. Well, actually, I think that's just self-publishing, Amazon Worlds. But what they've done is create separate licenses um, with some intellectual properties. Basically, this is not a good example, but Harry Potter, if they were licensed, the Harry Potter, uh, Harry Potter intellectual property, fans could write fan fiction, make money off of it. Um, I'm not sure what licenses Amazon does have for Kindle Worlds now. Uh, but basically, fan fiction can be made on some uh, original or not unoriginal works. This story, though, is from uh, Wired Magazine, and basically it's about how publishers are actually uh, getting fan bases from fan fiction writers, and they are hoping those fan bases that already exist will translate into new original works. Again, this is separate from... Uh, the intellectual properties that are licensed. I kind of confused that issue. These are original works by fan fiction writers. So basically, um, publishers are trolling these fan fiction websites, finding good authors that are already established, letting them write new original works, and they're saying, hey, maybe this is a new market. We can we can basically get um, you know authors that might not be considered quote unquote real, and uh, you know or or um, uh, established authors and trying to trying to sit here and find find new talent. So I thought it was interesting. What do you think? No, I, I think it's great. We, yeah, we did discuss it before that um, it's so hard to break into that publishing world. That this what a great opportunity they're being presented with. My only uh, my only concern is that whoever in the big blue sky is is managing the official storyline. Let, let's make sure that we don't end up with a universe that contradicts itself over and over and over because all these different fans wanted to go in different directions. And I, I don't know if that's really avoidable, but I hope somebody will control that to an extent. Yeah, that's with established uh, intellectual properties. Amazon, again, has a small select group. But um, th- this is kind of a slice away from, you know, it's, it's basically fan, how do we how do we exploit the fan fiction market with existing properties? But let's take writers that have, written in those existing properties, give them a chance to write their own new original work and make money off of them, which is just, you know, maybe undermining these bigger names because they have to, you know, it, it might lower the base for how much do you pay authors now. We can get these fan fiction authors real cheap, and, and big authors might have to, you know, compromise on their payday salary. So, yeah, sorry, I, I confused the story because there's a lot going on. It's kind of a slow bleed. You know, the, the lines are blurring 
as to what's possible and what's legal and actually uh, using a fan fiction, fan fiction community and then building them up into legitimate authors with big publishing companies, new relationships. Pretty crazy, pretty crazy. It's all, it's all blending together now. Uh, the second story we have is about, it's just a throwaway story, but J.K. Rowling, she's going back to the well. She's uh, Basically, she's debuted two parts on her Pottermore website, two parts to the history of Quidditch World Cup. Quidditch is her famous game in the Harry Potter books, which I have not yet read and plan to do so shortly. I'm trying to remain spoiler free. And so uh, it was with hesitation that I read this because there was a few spoilers in the Slate article that I read. I was a little annoyed, but that's beside the point. So the Quidditch World Cup, pretty lengthy, pretty in-depth. It's another nice little nugget for fans of Harry Potter. And uh, maybe I think you could replicate this in the real world. With all this history and detail, who knows? Maybe you could go make your own Quidditch game on the soccer field or something. Yay. Yeah, have fun with that. I won't be reading that one. I'll pass. Hey, she's going to have to get back into your standard Harry Potter stuff in order, I think, to keep readers' interest because I don't know of anyone, not that they're not out there, but I don't know of anyone who just goes and picks up and reads a novel about a soccer game. You know, I, I don't I don't get it. But, okay, she's probably got a plan. She's been she's a millionaire however many times over. She knows what she's doing, but uh, I'll pass on that one. Hey, but uh, our last news story is about J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, he, uh, before he died, he had done a translation of Beowulf, and he had made his own notes on it, and apparently his translation was, there were a little bit of differences to it, um, but, um, it looks like that's going to be published. Uh, his son has made a few edits on, on his father's work, and, uh, they're going to be publishing that in May, and I do look forward to that. Beowulf is one of my favorite stories. It, it's one of the originals, and, um, I love everything about Beowulf. Any movie that comes out about it, I'll watch it. Um, and uh, I, I certainly have my own copy of Beowulf here at the house and one of my favorite stories, so I'll definitely be picking that one up. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because uh, the publicate or the publishing of his translation also includes his annotations, um, his notes in that translation, which I, th um, I think he taught at Oxford or he did lectures at Oxford. So this is essentially one of the world's most renowned authors and his lectures to you know, a small class in you know, the early part of the century and we're able to see, go re essentially reach back in the past and be there in the classroom uh, for all intents and purposes and kind of see what this uh, might have been like, you know, what it might, he might have lectured on. So you're right, this is a first. Very fascinating. I, I, I know this is a little off topic, but it's reminiscent or reminds me of where we've come with online education these days and how we can have one incredible, incredible lecture you know, and, and who can reach thousands or millions across the world through technology. So it's kind of like being able to take one of the greatest authors and, you know, put him in the 21st century. You know, it's kind of scary. We could, you know, you could actually, you know, they've done creepy CGI. I call it creepy CGI kind of uh, re-envisionings of, uh, of, of people in the past and they put them, put them on the screen, you know, uh, with CGI effects. And they could essentially do this. They could recreate that whole experience. But... <laughs> that, that's a little off topic. That's a little futuristic. But speaking of futuristic, John, that's where we are in this hardcore science fiction novel. We're starting Hyperion Part 1, which is a Hugo Award winning novel by Dan Simmons we mentioned earlier. And this is set in the very distant future when man has conquered the stars and is still dominant in the galaxy. Yeah, I but, think about 700 years into the future. I think 700 years and things are very alien, but also yet very familiar. And it's it's it really is grounded in in human in the human condition, which hasn't changed very much. And our sins and our fears have followed us into the stars, John. Hyperion starts off as an interstellar mystery where the ruling empire, called the Hegemony of Men, is on the edge of potentially their biggest war with space barbarians known as the Ousters. But the heart of the story is a group of seven who converge on the planet Hyperion where the coming war in space is preceded by martial law on the surface and a population on edge waiting for an evacuation fleet. And there is another danger that lurks on the planet. Thousands have been killed by a mythical creature called the Shrike, which is now venturing further from its northern hiding place, the mysterious Time Tombs, and no one is safe. The seven characters, they are fascinating and they are flawed 
and each have secrets as to why they accepted to come on this perilous journey. It's a fascinating read so far, and it's a compelling look at a future in the stars. So, John, that's that was kind of my synopsis that I came up with. And the most compelling part of the story for me, the thing that keeps me turning pages just as fast as Game of Thrones, which I compared it to a little bit earlier, uh, is the fact that the story unfolds through the characters' experiences and it, it's their own explanations and their own dialogue and these completely co uh, colliding personalities and very different archetype characters. You know, it's a big ensemble cast, and you're thinking, wow, alien names, alien worlds is a lot to take in, but it's not because Dan Simmons is so deaf at handling creating these archetypes and, and creating points of view and dialogue between them that gives you nuggets of this universe but really focuses on them. So the perfect example is the prologue right out the gate with the consul. The consul is the former uh, ruling government official on Hyperion. So everybody in this book has a history with Hyperion. And I just told you how dangerous this planet was right now. So why would they go back? It seems a little far-fetched that they would actually go back essentially with Armageddon about to happen at this one point in the, in the, known, in the known universe. <laughs> so basically you find out there's some very compelling motives, very compelling motives for them, for them to come back. And that's why it's a killer mystery. And uh, the first character is the ruling official. They just call him the consul. But he's in the prologue. He's sitting on a planet getting ready to go on a hunt. He's in his dark black cruiser in the middle of this torrential rainstorm on a swamp planet with nothing but primordial, violent, wild beast, and he's about to go hunting, and he gets a call from the Senate CEO, and basically she says, we need we need you to close the time tombs. We need you to make sure our enemies, the ousters, don't get there because they could destroy us. If, if, the, if there is a secret, if there is some key to these time tombs, we have to, and we can't hold Hyperion, we have to shut it down. And so the, this... This console is getting this message, and you're, you're getting this sense of him being able to you know, make a decision out here on his own. Um, and he, he thought he was done with Hyperion. But uh, you immediately get pulled into this um, action, again, through the console, through his personal experience. We have a flashback to you know, a, a very traumatic event um, that he narrowly, narrowly survived. And you, you just get fed those little details that make it just compelling, and you want to find out, okay... What what's going to happen? This guy's going back. What's what's the guy going to be able to do this time? So, what do you think about the uh, the opening the opening sequence and how they pull you in, John? Or did it pull you in as much as me? No, no, it absolutely did. And and compared to the the, the last book we just did, this guy is able to feed you. The writing is so good, and I don't. I'm not going to harp on that over the next two podcasts either because. Just pick up the book and read it. This is probably the ultimate in writing that we're going to get with the way he's pushing the story ahead, but he's provided so much detail um, in the middle of that, well, I guess alongside of the story driving ahead, that it feels so real. And and um, so the, the console uh, was told right at the beginning of the story that one of the pilgrims who was selected to go on this journey could be an ouster spy. And you hear that right at the beginning, and you only hear it mentioned again one more time in the first third of this book. And so I'm still I'm still holding my breath on who the Alistair Spy is going to be because I like every single one of these pilgrims so far. Um, yeah, you're you're the, right, you're right. I forgot about that. Yeah, the the time tombs. I never really could figure out, but I I I do figure out later on in the book that no one can really get inside of those. Nobody really understands what they are. Um, they just know it has something to do with time. But, yeah, he, they're trying to get there to figure out any secrets before the ousters come in and take over that world, which the, the, um, the, the Senate CEO seemed convinced they were, they were taking over. I mean, they were already evacuating Hyperion uh, when the console got that message. So he's going to do, find out whatever he can before the ousters come in and just take it over. So, and, and, you know, the time tombs we do find out through the first third of the book what kind of what they are and we'll get to that point but basically they have to uh, get to Hyperion and one of the motifs in the book is time and time plays a big part I read the quote at the beginning of the book about these this uh, 
obscure obscure humans uh, who have who have conquered immortality or have figured out the secret of immortality. In this book, they talk about these seven pilgrims are part of a fringe or a minority population who basically travel so much from planet to planet and so many distances that they actually represent the recent recent uh, decades. Let me let me explain this. It's like they travel so much in cryogenic sleep that they represent maybe um, our our fathers or grandfathers because they're asleep and they don't age and when they show up at their destination they essentially are the same age but years have passed so they incur what uh, Dan Simmons describes as time debt I love the terminology and it, it took me a while to wrap my head around it but I love how he explains time travel and how you have to sit here and you know you have to go to sleep and you're in a uh, cryogenic fugue which is like this dream state and you don't age so these seven pilgrims are I'm not sure how many of them have, are, are constant space travelers, but time is a motif, and that's an interesting, uh, I guess, addition to the book, how they each represent maybe different eras. It's, it's like having someone in the 1960s who was born and was an adult in the 1960s and still about the same age here in 2013 because they, they took so many interstellar trips. And so the archetypes that are represented in the book are coming to full play when they're on their trip to Hyperion. And the console represents, I think, the reluctant leader. I'm not sure exactly what his motives are. Could he be the ouster spy? But he's a reluctant leader um, who was uh, the head government official in Hyperion for 11 years. And then there's the mysterious outsider, Hot Mustine, or Hat Mustine. He's the ship captain that brings them to the planet, and he's also one of the pilgrims. And then you have the scholar uh, who uh, has a mystery in his own. We have to, yet to find out. But the scholar is Sol Weintraub. Um, Maybe that's French. I'm completely butchering that name. And then you have the career soldier, Colonel Cassad, who we find out about in the first third. Plus, we have what I would describe as the hedonistic poet, Martin Salinas. He's a pretty uh, creepy old guy who uh, who's very vulgar. And again, some of some of his descriptions of the strike they 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 actually make for the best part of the reading because he just says it like it is. And then you have the tough mil paramilitary detective, Braun. Uh, Why me? What's her name? Lamia, Braun Lamia. Braun Lamia, thank you. And then the last one is the Catholic priest, Lenar Hoyt. So all of them basically very different people, would never socialize, would never be in the same room in real life. But then we find out that, uh, we again, there's, there's all this mysticism surrounding the Shrike. And the Shrike has been known about for centuries. Is it the only other sentient being in the universe? I mean, really, we, they, they don't talk about aliens in this, in this uh, book so far. Well, the yeah, they, they they don't talk about aliens, but but they they have a lot of aliens. And when we get into Father Hoyt's story, you'll find out very quickly that um, there is a very nasty alien on Hyperion that they they encounter, and it's not really like you said a sentient being, but it it is. I mean, it infests these these people. I mean, it, it's like a classic alien story where the alien infests the host, right? Oh yeah, and yeah, the, and yeah. then controls it. I mean. But the way the way Dan Simmons did it was so unique, right? It wasn't it wasn't this just killing machine, and it wanted that. now the the Shrike is, but I'm talking about this other <laughs> this other alien we're going to get to. The he's, parasite? He's, You're talking about the parasite? It, it was brilliant. But did you wonder with these um with these pilgrims, um, were were they all the first pick because they were all chosen by the Church of the Shrike? Because you find out on Hyperion, there's a whole church that's dedicated to worshiping the Shrike. And when you find out what the Shrike really is and what it's doing, you kind of go, yeah, this thing comes across like a godlike creature. It can move through time. So we know the time tombs are are correlated with the Shrike in some way. Um, but it can move throughout time. And they said it communicates by death. Um, so I mean, this thing this thing is a killer. It moves through time. Um, and and it they worship it like a god. There's a whole church. So the church of the Shrike is the one that contacted the hegemony and said, we want these six pilgrims. These, or was it seven? Seven uh, total. These seven. That's right. I'm forgetting about the the the. Hot Mustine, yeah, the the ship captain. But they wanted seven pilgrims to come to Hyperion and basically go through those time tombs before the ouster showed up. I mean, you had such a complicated environment that's built right at the beginning, and I just wanted to know: were all of those people that came, all seven of those pilgrims, were they all the first pick? Because think about today, like real life, um, if you'd said seven names, like an actor, I want Arnold Schwarzenegger to play in this movie. 
you may not get your first pick, so you got to have backups. And I just kept wondering, I wonder if some of these people were backups. I wonder, I wonder if they were all the first pick. Probably they were, but I just couldn't get my mind off that. Um, you know what? That's a good point. And, but Dan Simmons doesn't weigh down the story and try and describe no. the, the political and social complexities of the future where the, 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 the classic Christian church will find out in this first section of the book, which is a very a very deep introspection into human behavior and the human condition when you're in exile and, and it challenges your beliefs and it's a Catholic priest who's in exile. So it's the death of the classic Christian church and then the Church of the Shrike, what are their political motives, connections, and basically how do they pick these very different people to go on probably what's the last pilgrimage um, because it's a, it's a regular thing to have a pilgrimage. And, and you're right. I mean, I could get into conspiracy theory territory and say that they have – no, I don't, I don't want to get into conspiracy no, no, theory. No, we, we don't want to – there's too much to go over. You're, you're right because I don't know how they picked them, but they, they would never be in the same room otherwise in life. But each of them – we know that the first two people, and all of them have very long histories with Hyperion. So the Church of the Shrike probably, because of the world, they call it the World Web, which is essentially how the whole um, 150 colonies are connected, and and it's kind of like you have artificial intelligence and a whole new, you know, whole information internet of the future called the World Web. So basically, you know, they have information at their disposal, and they probably picked them, picked them pretty carefully. But if if we move forward. And we find out that, hey, these guys are stuck together. Long story short is they actually start sharing each other's stories with them because, again, uh, Martin Salinas, the, the hedonistic poet who's, who's traveled so much that they reference he might be a little kooky, crazy. But he says the most simplistic ways to advance uh, to, to, to kind of give you insight into the story. He said, hey, people who go on the pilgrimage, basically everyone dies except one person. The Shrike is supposed to fulfill one wish for one person, right? So let's figure out, you know, why each of us is here. And he, he he's, just, he's just very funny and kind of, you know, kind of revealing the mythology of the Shrike. And like you said, this thing has uh, is being worshipped. And you you actually proved to me how a cult behind the Shrike could come about with your synopsis of what it is being a godlike creature. But I still think they're a bunch of lunatics um, who Pro worship probably. the who worship this thing. Yeah, they are. They call them, you know, suicide seekers because no no one who goes to the time tombs ever returns. Um, but maybe there's a secret that hasn't been revealed yet. But the first person to share their story. So these guys kind of, you know, they kind of begrudgingly are kind of sit here and very strategically say, okay, let, let's share our stories. And each of them is going to tell a certain amount of truth. But Lenar Hoyt, the Catholic priest, is the first one up. So well, as they're now I got yeah. I got to jump in here though, but the reason they wanted to share the stories is because if they're going to go up against a death dealing being, they they thought that maybe the information from their collected stories might give them an advantage in a moment of extreme crisis, and maybe they could figure out how to survive. The, You're right. You know, all the different stories and knowledge from them, and that's very different from anything I've ever read or or seen uh, when you've got a a group of travelers going together on an adventure. Um, You're right. They actually You're sit right. down and, and, and like educated people, they talk out their stories and try to figure out something that would help them. So anyway. And that and that's a good that's a good uh, story mechanism to get us, you know, to hear each each of their stories. And so that's what the bulk of the story is about. You think it'd be a slow narrative, but basically the Catholic priest, he short he pulls the short straw and basically he has to tell a story first. They all pick a piece of paper. And Lenara Hoyt essentially went to Hyperion with another Catholic priest who was going into exile. And uh, in the brief time they were together, we find out that this uh, this career, you know, a very old, almost near retirement priest named Peter Doré uh, found an obscure piece of information about a uh, secluded tribe on Hyperion, and he wants to go spread the gospel to them or, you know, see if this tribe actually exists. And this is, again, through his journals, we uh, the the main character in the pilgrimage, Lenar Hoyt, found they found the journals. So this whole story is his very insightful, you know, uh, personal, uh, deep memories and uh, thoughts. And so it's cool to actually have, you know, that first person perspective from the journals. And that's how the story comes to us. But basically, the story, the uh, world of Hyperia or Hyperion is actually opened up to us through the journals too. You come to care, you come to understand the geography, the population, so it's kind of a, a great world building technique. And uh, Keats is a giant spaceport where they touch down at and then they depart. 
you know, basically Hoyt doesn't know much about him, and he just says, you know, good luck finding this uh, lost tribe, which is on the other side of a burning forest. The flame forest is a seasonal uh, forest. Yes, the, that, the, that, the, the Tesla trees. The Tesla trees and the uh, Prometheus Prometheus trees, all these fun names, and, and seasonally it just pretty much blows up. And we'll f and that's a great part of the book, but the 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 tr the the actual journey to get there, we find out is just it shows it shows how interesting Hyperion is, and is you know you have the rich uh, city of Keats, and you have the poor city of Port Romance, and you have what I thought was kind of uh, and um. Uh, what's that movie with Martin Sheen going up the uh, Vietnam River to uh, to find that renegade? Uh, oh yeah, Apocalypse Now. Yep, yeah, Apocalypse it did feel now. like that, didn't it? Yep. It felt like Apocalypse Now, just uh, Peter Dore's journey to get to this lost tribe, and he actually gets a guide at the very end. You know, he 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 has serious doubt um, about if he'll ever make it there, about his decision to come there, because there's such misery on this planet, and there's. It's just uh, you know this far outpost. So you get all this detail, but right as as the story is driving ahead, and that that's what I was saying at the beginning was that 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 detail it made it feel so real that I was really I was really involved in this book. But the story kept moving ahead. It wasn't he wasn't taking time just to tell me about everything what it looked like in the room, and everything was alongside of the actual story, just making yes. it feel so real. I, you know, I'd have to really study Dan Simmons' work to figure out how he really pulled that off in this book. But it was, it was great. And I, I want to jump in too about, about the, about these, these people he's going to visit because I think it's an important point that Hyperion has a few known cities and continents, right? And um, they know about the Flame Forest, but these, these people were kind of a mystery to everyone. So everyone knew they were kind of there. They're called the Bakura. No, a myth. They were a myth because okay, there's, yeah. only one recorded, uh, there's only one recorded story of them actually existing. So it's like he's on a wild goose chase. Right, and he, he thinks to him, to, well, to, to, to DeRay, they're more important than trying to go study the time tombs during this exile. And so he wants to go find these, these Bakura and find out who they are and what they are. And the myth is that there was a lost ship during the colonization hundred, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years ago that crashed on Hyperion. And these people are supposedly survivors of that ship. And and um, so anyway, but driving the story ahead, he does actually get a guide. They somehow make it through the flame forest and these Tesla trees, even though they start to act up, which basically lightning shoots from the sky, and these Tesla trees are gathering the lightning, and then the lightning shoots off from the Tesla trees and just fries everything around them, um, if, that's, if that's the most accurate description of that. But they get through there, and he does. He finds... He finds the Bakura, and then the mystery begins. What are they? Because they look sexless. They appear to be. The book described them as either having um, Down syndrome, retarded or, kids. Right. They just seemed mindless, and so there was quite a there was quite a bit of Duray's story there as he's trying to communicate with them. He's trying to find out what they are. He's trying to get them to, hey, pull your robe back. I want to see what your anatomy looks like. I want to see what you look like under there. He never saw any of them naked or bathing yeah. or anything like that. We have like to that. qualify that statement. We Couldn't cannot say out. this is a, a Catholic priest who's trying no, to No, no, no. Okay. He, we he's haven't also, talked about he's that. Also an ethno, what do you call it? An ethnologist and an archaeologist and everything else. He's a scientist as well. He didn't see them doing daily functions that any normal human being would have done. There was something very different about their anatomy, and that is actually true, as we find and, out. And where he gets them to open up, you know, I think uh, that one of the most best parts of the book for me was when he survived the flame forest, and he thanked God for letting him sing this wonderful thing, this wonderful deadly thing, but um, that, that plays an important part because that is the boundary that keeps this tribe separated, which for what? 300 years they've been able to live there and they call themselves the three score and ten which uh, and I guess in old English math that adds up to 70 because three scores is uh, one scores 20 but you anyway, know simple math so the three score and ten never be never they never become a big tribe um, and they're all the same age and you're right they never do any daily functions and they're trapped on this other side of the flame forest in this huge uh, ravine um, a cliff so geographically, they're isolated. And so this mystery gets really interesting. The whole first part of the book is the mystery of the Bikura. And they 
can't answer his questions. These guys simply can't cannot connect basic concepts of time and of uh, you know of of sexes and of of many other things. It's just he really thinks they're mentally challenged and they don't know how to use fire or anything. But he gets their routine down and he records all their knowledge. But he finds out that they go on a secret nightly ritual over the edge of the cliff. They climb down vines. And so after this long period of study where the dude gets nothing, he essentially says, what's going on down there? What's this mystery? And he tries to follow them, and they politely push him back. Um, he's never scared of them, but this is the first time they've challenged him. They won't let him go down the vines. Well, now, so Josh, we, we missed one important detail, and that is when he first ran across them, he had a guide. And in the night, the Bakura came, and they killed his guide. That is an important they, detail. They, they did not kill him. <laughs> and when he asked them why, they said, you are of the cruciform. And suddenly, the, the Bakura, Bakura, whatever we want to call them, had a totally different meaning to me. Because they saw his Catholic cross hanging around his neck, and they said, you're of the cruciform. And we can't kill you. And they said, we are of the cruciform. And suddenly, I'm thinking, oh, wow, are these religious zealots or I mean what are they but they're talking clearly about the cross yes the cross yes. Jesus died on there's ties to the Catholic Church in some way here and uh, he is only alive because he is of the cruciform and that is an important point the fact that he he could have been terrified and held hostage but after he verified and they admitted outright because they're so simple they just said yes we killed him and that was the explanation you're right so where we where we come now is him trying to sneak past them uh, uh, during one of their routines where he can actually climb down the vines, and he does. He basically, after a, a period of weeks, he makes his way down and he finds out the mystery of what they've been doing every night. And this this is pretty life changing for him. It's for me it's a little reminiscent of Space um, 2001, the Space Odyssey. Because what he finds when he come, he goes down is this uh, ancient, ancient uh, temple, basically that pre can't be uh, as young and couldn't have been constructed by the Bikura. It's ancient. He said thousands you know, of years old. Thousands of years said. old. But before, which, before man, before men on Earth ever left and colonized. Exactly. Which basically, what he finds inside when he gets to the entrance and goes inside. What's uh, reminiscent of 2001, uh, The Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke, is when he goes in there, it's this huge, huge, empty um, cathedral type. Well, it's, it's just flat out empty, bigger than any cathedral he's ever been to. And in the center of it is a cross. It is the cruciform. It's incredibly large you know, centerpiece, kind of like the monolith in 2001, which is what made me think of it. But... And then the light being shown at sunset there, and then the sounds in there, it's just like his senses are um, assaulted by this mosaic of light and this, this sound cacophony um, that comes from, from nature. And just, or it sounds like organs and everything just makes him just immediately think, how did this get here? And this could change everything in human society because yeah, it he creates. Said, he said it could revive the church because the Catholic Church was dying. It was on its, it was on its deathbed. Uh, I guess that 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 religion was just going away. Fewer and fewer people were, but uh, uh, were were adhering to it. But he thought this could save the church. You're right. You're right. And and basically, you know, you can sit here and say, well, this is a big leap. I mean, how did this get here? I mean, come on. This, you know, there there's this. Dan Simmons has brought us this far, and you're like, really? A huge room with the cross? You could you could be cynical, but that's not the point. The point is, is that we've found a mystery, and that's the whole point. It's like an ancient. It's like the Easter Islands on Earth or Stonehenge on Earth. You can just you can you chalk it up to an ancient mystery. It doesn't have to have meaning just because symbolically it's a cross, but for him it has tremendous meaning. And so he starts. He he has renewed energy plans to sit here and maybe find find out a little bit more about the Bicura. What's their connection to this? Study them in a new light, different respect. How does he get pa passed back to Flame Force? So he's really excited. He's trying to record all this. It occurs to him that he's got to write it down um, because his uh, he, he created hol holographic projections with his medical equipment and he, he's doing a really good job um, recording the, the archaeology aspect. 
But then he makes a mistake in his elation and in his, you know, his excitement. He basically uh, violates a taboo. He's washing in a river, um, half naked, and you know the the bikura are basically robed, and they're like, no, that was wrong, and they basically are dragging him, and they say, you are not of the cross. I believe if I'm getting the details right from this part of the book, they're essentially about to lynch him because he, he violated this taboo, and somehow it, it it basically made them think of him as not one of them. And he's, right. he's, he, he's about to die the true death, where they the cut true. his throat and all of his blood. Is that, that was important, too. There's death, and then there's the true death, as you find out later. But, yeah, they're saying he's not of the cross. So he makes one last gambit, and he basically says, I've been over the cliff. I've seen the cruciform. I worship <laughs> there. He's worshipped at the cruciform, and the big gambit basically throws these guys into kind of a tizzy because intellectually they're <laughs> like, whoa, wait a minute. You weren't supposed to go there. Wait a minute. Um, let's process this. And there's there's <laughs> actually division among the group about true death or let's talk about it, which they're not big on talking. So this whole scene is really interesting because the whole time when the story is being told from these journals, you're like, when's he going to die? When's he going to get it? Because you find the journals, but you don't find him. So Dan Simmons plays on your expectations. Is he dead or not dead? And that's, what, again, another thing I absolutely love. But he does survive. And they say you have to be of the cruciform, even though there's only three score and ten of them, and there shouldn't be any more than that number, and they've always been at that number. They're like, the, the debate, that the, they, finally, they finally decide you have to be of the cruciform. And so they go back to the church, or I call the church, the temple, and they basically have a ceremony there, and they say it's over, it's done, this portion. And uh, there's a staircase that leads down from the temple, down all the way to the very bottom of the, the ravine, which is, I don't know, several, several thousand feet, and it takes them all day to get there. So he's basically been initiated. And so it's a quick thing, but the big, the big reveal comes at the bottom of this ravine. There's this uh, dark entrance that Peter Dure instinctively knows is the entrance to this ancient, ancient archaeological mystery that exists only on nine worlds and the known 150 settled planets. Or excuse me, the known 8,000 planets that have been surveyed. There's about 150 settled planets, but there's nine worlds exactly that have these ancient catacombs artificially made. Labyrinths. They're called the labyrinths, and the labyrinthine, labyrinthine planets, that's a, a tough word to say. There's only nine of, nine of them, and he realizes one of these great mysteries that no one's been able to figure out. Um, he's found one of the entrances to it. So he's now suddenly interested in what is one of the greatest mysteries in the known universe, which beforehand he wasn't. And this is an important part of the book because it introduces us, it kind of shows the Shrike and his I guess his first form, his first iteration, because they go into the labyrinth, labyrinths and the, the Bakira worship and lay down and the lights, it's completely dark, but then all of a sudden in these tunnels that they have entered are all these crosses, luminescent crosses. Yeah, and, they're, they're about like an inch high. I mean, they're, they're tiny little crosses on the cavern walls. Well, he said they ranged inside. Ranged inside. inside. There were tiny ones, there were larger ones, but they look like what he said, shells? Kind they of look, they look like they coral. Yeah. yeah. And John, the interesting thing here is this is like a life-changing moment for him, not at this point, but it's kind of getting there because it, the mystery deepens. It's all these cru these crosses. Where did they come from? And all of a sudden, the Shrike appears. That we get we get a, a up, cl up close and personal. We are we are seeing the written the written historical record of a person who survived. And was able to write about it. We know he survives because we're reading his his uh, his actual uh, uh, encounter with the Shrike. So the Shrike comes up to him. An interesting thing that puts beyond a shadow of a doubt for me uh, that this thing is evil is not just the description, the red ruby eyes, the kind of uh, transparent metallic skin with all these blades and disjoint disjointed limbs and four arms and the thing disappears and comes right up to his face and he's more exalted than in fear and this is a very powerful part of the book because he says he knows just like if you were to see a devil or a demon that that 
because of the existence of this thing in front of me, I know that had the antithesis, the God of Abraham exists if this thing exists. Because it's this this insane moment where he, he might die, but he's more curious and more like what I my beliefs, my whole lifelong beliefs have been verified because this demon is standing right in front of me. So it's a fascinating part of the book. And Josh, I, I got to jump in here too because that the writing Dan Simmons used, the description of what Father DeRay was seeing when he looked into those crazy jeweled, you know, fire eyes of the Shrike, best description in the entire first part of that book. That floored me. Um, so I don't. I'm not going to read. I'm not going to. I'm not going to actually say the whole thing here. If you're a listener or a viewer and you haven't gotten to that part of the book or or, or you haven't read this at all, you need to read that description. That was awesome. It was. Um, it was absolutely but, but, incredible. You're you're right. He survived that encounter with the Shrike, and then and 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 we're taking a long time to get to a uh, a big plot point here. But one of the Bakura takes. I think it was Alpha, right? He had named a few of them. Alpha takes one of those little cruciforms on the wall, and he puts it on a necklace, and he puts it on Father Duray's chest. And then, of course, he's been up for 24 hours at that point, and he's so exhausted. They end up carrying him back up the steps on top of the cliff. And when he wakes up the next morning, that cruciform has actually embedded into his chest. He cannot get it off. Like it is, and and he actually explains this must be what they mean when they say they are of the cruciform. He is literally one with that cruciform. And you start making connections between the cruciform and the shrike, because that was where they went to worship. Apparently, the shrike. And and then and then I started to think, but they have a church of the Shrike on Hyperion, and maybe the true worshippers of the Shrike are these Bakura, and um, it doesn't necessarily answer that, at least not in the first third of this book. And that's where the quote that I uh, quoted in the beginning comes in. He basically can't get it off of him. He realizes that they, and through subsequent events, uh, a few of them die, and that they they come back, they're resurrected. They can't die yeah, that because the, them alive. The, Re, yeah. the thing keeps them alive. It's a parasite. He tries to study it. So there is a lot. I mean, there's this whole change. He he now can't leave because he's like, I'm out of here. Can't get it off of me. There's a whole series of events where he finds out they can't die. They they stay seventy. The number exactly seventy because um, the the cruciform brings them back. And they're all the same age and, and the same beings, essentially a little bit altered. And he tries to leave through the flame force, flame force, and gets um, this uh, chest pain, he, like he's having a heart attack. So the the crucifix actually hates pain, and it makes him come back. He'll faint. He try, he sits here several times, and he faints from the pain, and he and he, he finds himself back closer to the camp when he wakes up. Because like they won't the, let him leave. Like the, yeah, the crucifix has dragged him back uh, subconsciously. So there's this. This come this reckoning within himself. I think it's it's deeply spiritual, obviously for him. He's seeing the end of his life. Does he want to live here? Um, that uh, even he, at first he wanted to get the the news of the cruciform or the, that 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 um, that news of uh, the, the the temple out to people. But now he's like, we have to tell people that the shrike is evil. I don't know if he says that explicitly, but that this don't come here. This place is dangerous, and so he makes. Uh, we're, we're kind of fast forwarding. You're right. There's a major plot point. Uh, hey, I think. Go ahead. You, you mind if I jump in here real quick? Um, yeah. There, um, there's something I wanted to talk about in particular with this scene. There, there were a couple of things I noted, and they, and Dan Simmons didn't take a lot of time discussing this, but he said it. When a couple of the members died from falling off a cliff or a misstep up high in a tree, they would take them to the temple, and this, and he watched one of them one night. This parasite, it had filaments running throughout their whole body, and it actually it decomposed them and recomposed them all within about a 24-hour period. But it took a total of three days for that that individual, that Bakura, to actually come back to life. So this is going to sound far-fetched, but it's not far-fetched. And I I think um, I think Dan Simmons may have been trying to tell us something else, and maybe we haven't seen in the book just yet. So I started making correlations between the Catholic Church these cruciform parasites, and the Shrike. And one of the things that I considered that Dan Simmons might be trying to say is that this may be where Christianity originated from. Now, 
I don't know. I don't believe that myself. But I got the idea because the the Shrike can move throughout time. It's able to move through time. And as you hear later in the book, when you're talking about when you hear Kassad's story, General uh, Colonel Kassad, the Shrike it seems like it can move to other worlds. We know there's nine labyrinths, right? Or nine nine right. labyrinth worlds. So I, to me, the Shrike has probably visited these other worlds. And I started to wonder if Christianity didn't come from or the, 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 the concept of Christianity, the religion didn't come from the Shrike. Having gone to Earth at some point, perhaps even a member who had who was of the cruciform going to Earth, because now you've got that direct correlation between them being of the cruciform and 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 the, the, the and Christianity on Earth worshiping the cross that Jesus died on. And then it makes me start to wonder if Jesus wasn't according to Dan Simmons, wasn't one of these beings, one of these Bakura that had gone to Earth or, or way, way in the past before that, and he died, and exactly three days later in the Bible, Jesus is resurrected. So I started making all these crazy correlations in my head, <laughs> and I thought, I mean, Conspiracy you know, that's really, really far-fetched, but do you not see all the correlations there? No, you're three right. Days, with with the element of time and, travel, yeah, yeah, time travel in the labyrinthine worlds, basically anything is possible. And I just uh, stumbled and over and myself right. the, whole, the whole way through that, sorry. No, but basically, you have a, a valid a valid hypothesis. You know, these guys do look like monks. But I think people who might think a lot, this is maybe a religious story, go down along those lines. We'll see. We'll see the second character's story actually kind of rebuff that or show the Shrike's actual intentions. So I don't think anything this evil um, has has any good intentions toward spreading goodwill and and love toward men. So. Where do we come in the story is a life and death decision. Peter Dore essentially says, I don't want to become like these people. He doesn't know if he'll lose his intellect, but he knows he's trapped there. He doesn't know if he'll become like these, these lethargic people who do nothing. And he's, but he's terrified at the prospect of uh, what the Shrike could do in the universe. Like you said, unleashed. He's got to tell people what he's found out. And uh, we come to the point in the end of the story, the narration, where Lenar Hoyt, has, who's going back to Hyperion to find out the mystery of what happened. He actually does know what happened. And this is kind of a quick segue. He finishes the story at the round table with the people. He says, that's it. We found his journals. And the console, he's a smart guy. He doesn't believe them. So when they're departing for the planet, uh, this is a, a little bit of a character development. Uh, Lenar Hoyt is not with them when they're about to depart. And the console finds him in his room ag in agonizing pain. And this is the creepy thing. The rest of the story is now told here, but it's under threat of withholding medicine because this extreme pain can be cured by one shot. The console grabs it, says, tell me the rest of the story, and then I'll give you the shot. And Lenar Hoyt's like, uh, he's not too happy with them. He's, he says some things a priest wouldn't normally say. But he, t he tells the rest of the true story, which is when he went back, he went back to the planet to find uh, Peter Dore. And they, they basically enlist one of the plantation owners. They fly out in a bushwhacker, and they find him dead. He, he, eventually, he essentially, uh, well, he told the whole group that they found him dead in the flame forest. And, that, and the journal survived because it's in fireproof paper or fireproof plant leaves. But basically the true story is that um, they landed in the flame forest. They were taken down near there. The Bakura captured them, and Lenar Hoyt was the only survivor. Again, the others were massacred because they were not of the cruciform. He was of the cruciform, and they, I think, infected him. I'm, I'm guessing that he was, he was the replacement for Peter Dore. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out, basically, what the console finds out is on his chest. The reason Lenar Hoyt's going back is because he has the cruciform on him. In what really happened to Peter Dore, his last gambit to die, to not be immortal, and this was a very tough book part of the book to read. He basically crucified himself on a Telsa tree in the flame forest because he didn't want to be immortal. He didn't want to keep coming back to life and be reanimated. He 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 said, "I can be totally destroyed," and they knew that you could be totally destroyed. Um, and he thought the flame forest would do it, uh, but it but basically. Um, it didn't do it just because he got for seven strapped. years. For seven years, he was strapped to the tree. And he he got reanimated because he was his body wasn't totally destroyed by the flames, and that was kind of creepy in itself. Um, but the the cruciform was put on Lenar Hoyt, and then the other 
uh, Peter Dore's cruciform was also put on him because I think they had to keep the same amount of numbers. This is a little fuzzy. I don't want to get bogged down in it, but it was it was kind of eye opening. That's his reason for going back to Hyperion is to get rid of this pain and to stop you know this insanity that's happening to him that happened to his predecessor, uh, Peter Dore. So it's kind of creepy. We find out his motivation here. We find out what the console is capable of. And he's he's he he needs to know the truth. So he he's trying to collect, like you said, the most information possible to fight the Shrike. And I'm fascinated to see you know, where things go from here. Um, and we you can mention what what you might have to say about that part of the story before we launch into Colonel Kassad's story. No, no, I'm 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 good. The only thing I'd wanted to talk about, I already did with with that potential correlation of how you know religion came to earth a worshiping god and i i still think it may have something to do with the shrike i might be completely wrong i just i couldn't help but letting my mind go there but but moving on to colonel kasad this is where this is where you start to get the space action laser blasters and you know uh, what did they call it uh, uh, um, when they when they did a uh, a uh, strike from outer space um, i keep wanting to say they call that yeah, yeah slacking them or something like that. It was it had some pretty cool terms, but uh, there was a lot of a lot of headshots and a lot of <laughs> completely destroyed people and throwing forces into a into a battle where hundreds of thousands died. So you know, this is where basically Dan Simmons plays with our expectations again. Basically, uh, Colonel Kassad is a a war not a war criminal, but he could be considered you know a, a butcher, a, a butcher. A, a, basically, a, a what they they have it the call the code of Bashira or Bashira I can't remember it, it was Bushido. Bushido thank you I'm getting Bakira and Bushido all mixed <laughs> up but what it was in the century since the 21st century when there was all out war basically we're they're supposed to fight limited wars protect civilian populations so but they couldn't basically Colonel Kassad is this archetype who's seen as maybe a war criminal and we're, we have no sympathy for him but when we see his story. When we're now in Hyperia, we get there and we're on a, a barge going north. We're on our six-day trek to see the Shrike. We get to hear his story. And it's fascinating because he goes to this command school. He's a Palestinian that lives in the slums his whole life. He knows street fighting. And we get to know him. And he's in these simulations through war school that take him through all the great battles of history. And it's awesome to see you know him and how he reacts in the future of war gaming. You know, again, some technology and, and how things have and haven't changed, and how they're trained in the future. So we get to, we get Colonel Kassad fleshed out first in the the Battle of Agincourt between the French and the British in one of these hollow simulations, and his story opens up and it's it's framed as a love story because in this Battle of Agincourt where he's an archer and where the and the English are outnumbered uh, twenty eight thousand to eight thousand by the French cavalry. And uh, heavy armored, um, you know, the heavy armored cavalry and the infantry, they still win. And he's an archer in that hollow sim, and it's just a great scene. But he goes off in the woods and he meets this woman who helps save him uh, because he's fighting a hand to hand combat. And he's, he's, severely, he's severely outmatched. And the woman saves him. He's instantly in love. And basically, there's this connection and this framing of who he is right out the gate. He wants to search for her the rest of his life because. She disappears after the Hall of Sin is over, and um, and we think she, you know, who knows, she could be another cadet. But we find out that she reappears only in these battle uh, simulations with Colonel Kassad. And it's really fascinating, and he realizes that she's not real. She's probably a computer simulation, and he could be crazy, and it wouldn't look good on a psych report if he told anybody. So this whole relationship happens, and he graduates. And uh, there's some great backstory to him. I love the references to the John Carter Brigade. Yeah, yeah, I picked up on that too. Yeah, he he really surprised me. He gets enlisted. Um, he 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 basically um, works his way through the ranks. And the thing that made him famous, which I love, and we have to touch on real quick, was when he was a lieutenant. And there was these Sunnis and Shiites have their own planet, and basically they're still at you know holy war in the future. It's it, again very familiar context, but it's set in the future. And he and with the code of Bushido, he has to do limited warfare, and he basically gives the dictator three-hour deadline to release all the hegemony citizens. There's about 8,000 hostages, and this is bad. This is like uh, the Iran hostage crisis on a scale of 100. Bad. And basically, he, he says, give you three hours. They say no. He uses his tactical proficiency, and this is where we find out how tactically 
good he is at warfare. He takes um, old archaic defense satellites. He harnesses their their uh, energy, detonates yeah. them yeah, above, the, above the atmosphere when he detonates yeah. the nukes. I love it because he pinpoints the actual terrorist with their microchips on the planet and with their uh, radioactive energy from this nuclear blast above the atmosphere. He can pinpoint. Pinpoint mic- drop Yeah, they, they were pinpointing <laughs> microwaves. I think they were. Was it microwaves or some kind of other? Yeah. Yeah. ray that yeah. comes off of a nuke and yeah he <laughs> and it seems believable it seems like something that our defense uh folks right now would have in the army and it's ra- really fascinating because the head dictator basically his head uh he dies on national television and about uh 80 uh, percent of all the other terrorists die it works and so he becomes this uh you can go ahead and say it josh there may have been pieces of his head missing yes it. It, for two whole minutes it basically <laughs> it basically stopped a potential jihad, and the guy becomes a military hero. But fast forward to the main conflict we're encountering now, the mysterious Alsters. Um, they are these humans before the Hawking Drive was invented, went out to outer space. They grew up on asteroids. They live in zero G. So they are hum- they are our ancestors who have splintered off. And what are they? They're, 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 they're vagabonds, right? Wrong. They're not these space vagabonds. They're barbarians that, even though they don't have farcaster technology, which um, which gets you through space space much faster than a normal, you know, hyperdrive or Hawking drive where you have to sleep. The farcaster technology that we own supposedly makes the hegemony force superior. Doesn't because the Alsters attack a rich planet, and basically the butcher Abrugia. Or Brescia, which Br- Colonel Brescia, Prasad, yeah, it was Brescia. Brescia, his nickname is the Butcher of Brescia. This is where he gets his claim to infamy or fame because the Alsters, who uh, heretofore are seen as just vagabonds of the universe, attack one of our biggest, biggest, richest uh, planets and basically murder half the population and they take it over. Seven months later, seven months later, we come in with the Farcasters, which got us there uh, that quickly. And then we use the portals, the Farcaster portals, to jump down to the planet, and we come to this guerrilla warfare where basically you can't do you can't do limited war. And after months, nine, 90 days of fighting, basically uh, the colonel makes his decision to nuke the planet. And this thing is just a fascinating entry into who this man is and decisions he had to make to get where he was and. Uh, you know, make the right decision for the Gemini. So uh, that's kind of his claim to fame. And and, and, and we're I, fine. yeah, I, I have to jump in here though, um, and and not to not to make the podcast go too long, but there was it was always assumed that they the Alistairs really were barbarians. And when you get to the Battle of Brescia, you find out how tactically sound they really are. The defenses they set up were annihilating. Kassad's troops as they were coming through, and and for all the intense training he was put through as a cadet, all the battles he saw in the Holocaust, could you imagine a military officer being trained by actually living the battles from history and up to modern day? I mean, you would know everything about everything. It's and amazing, he, yeah. He, he had been through all that, and he hit. He, he you thought he was really sound when he when he stopped the Sunnis from fighting with the Shiites or the other way around in the other battle, but. On this planet, on this battle, the Butcher of Brescia, he sends through wave after wave of his own men, and they are slaughtered over and over and over by the Alsters. Now, they're, they're taking ground as they go, but how tactically unsound. He <laughs> lost hundreds of thousands, and yeah. when, when they call him the Butcher of Brescia, I had a hard time liking this guy. You know, he, he did some really awesome stuff himself, which we're going to get to in a second, but he wasted his own men like they were, like it was a computer game. Um Fighting and and then of course he's known as the butcher for I guess nuking the planet, but he slaughters so many of his own men. That's a good point. It's I'm wondering, you know, I hate to say it, how the commander in chief, the politicians who make the final decision would have allowed him. He didn't have the nuke option. That's the whole point. They they emphasize the code of Bushido so that the military wouldn't sit here and um, essentially be thrown out of power or be reevaluated because they have to do limited warfare. So he followed that. And he tried to live within those codes, and then finally he convinced the other generals to say, we have to nuke this planet. But yeah, that, the, the, the Alsters don't follow that, and you figured that out quickly. It was like watching the Revolutionary War again. 
we ended up hiding a lot of our guys in the trees while the British were marching in lines out of the field, and, and you know, we would lay down and shoot or shoot from the tree, and there, there's no one in front of us for us to shoot, and, you know, they don't fight the same way we do, and the Ousters, they don't care about Bushido. They just That's don't. A it's a good point that you make about they... Hard lesson. Kassad not having respect for him because he couldn't really figure it out sooner, but after 90 days, at least it wasn't longer than 90 days. But like you said, he's proficiently, uh, proficiently good at uh, being a career soldier because we find out when he's being uh, he's recovering after the big battle he's recovering on a hospital ship which gets attacked by the ousters and it's blown to oblivion and he qu he, qu he thinks quickly this is an incredible space scene and it, this gets near to the end where we're at in the book and it shows his connection with Hyperion but this incredible space scene he's above the planet he, he quickly calculates with limited air with this freezing no atmosphere, and it's becoming freezing in this ship. He, 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 all the bulkheads are being ripped apart. There's hardly any, any, any place to actually get to a, a sealed room. That, that it is an intense, one of the best scenes I think in the book so far. Because he quickly gets into a marine suit. He quickly analyzes. I am under attack. I mean, everything is just by the numbers. It's his whole career, like you said, coming into play. It just everything clicks because of all his training, and he's in this marine suit. And he sees these squid, ship-to-ship, -ship, squid-looking ouster uh, um, ships coming his way to see what's left in the wreckage. And I actually absolutely love it because he has less than 10 minutes, and they say that. Love the book about, again, the descriptions of everything come down to even time and distance, and it's amazing. And so he, he, he does the, awesome, the best ambush ever, John. He floats in the only surgical bay. The surgical bay is the only thing left. The lasers are operational. He's floating like a dead man. And the uh, Alistair's come in in two-man teams. And these things, these, we find out, uh, the first, like an alien encounter. These guys have been living in zero G for so long that they, they basically, you know, they, they, they can swim. It's like they're swimming in water. That's their environment. And they have artificial tails and their toes are like monkeys. They grab onto things as easily with their hands. So it's kind of freaky that he's totally not out of his element. They're in their element. And he can't survive a 20-man crew. But he does, and this the first two man team that comes through the surgical, the medical bay, he, he zaps them with the lasers, slices them, goes and gets the sonic gun before the other one rounds the corner, and zaps yeah. them straight to right, the head. Right to the head, yeah. That, that was intense. I loved it. I was, I was, was just eating that scene up. It was amazing. Then he takes out three more. Um, he would have only taken out two, but the third one comes back and. Uh, he, he just, it's, it's like a get some moment, and he basically knows <laughs> that he's got to get to the ship. There's all kinds of chatter on the radio. He gets to the squid ship, and, you know, again, Dan Simmons makes it believable because the character, we're, we're hearing from his first-person perspective, this is an alien ship. I can maybe, you know, wing one of my military vehicles and figure out controls, but this is alien and foreign, so, you know, makes it kind of this clumsy escape where he's hitting all the dashboard controls, and he's uh, he's zooming throughout his space toward the atmosphere. He basically is surviving, but only he's only one step, literally, or ten meters ahead of the Ousters, because three assault, assault ships come after him from the main ship, and he's counting on the fact that they want revenge, that they won't blow him straight out of the sky, and they do want revenge. They want to find out how the heck that they they ambushed this medical ship, and one person actually took out a whole team, and so they want revenge, and they follow him. And he burns up through the atmosphere, and which is an amazing scene in himself. Every minute, he's thinking old ships from from yesteryear and ancient history had ejection pods, and he's burning up, and he finds an ejection pod. So it seems all unbelievable, but then things get weird because he loses consciousness, and you think, "What is this? Is this going to be a dream?" Because the woman that we talked about, you know, hours ago now, it seems like she basically <laughs> come, she comes back, and the woman is like. You know, you survive. The the Lord of Pain <laughs> help, yeah, and, and help. She's you real. Out. She's real. She's not a hologram. She's she's. I didn't right make there. that. I, I didn't make that connection right off the bat. You still think it's a dream, but he did land on Hyperion because he was floating ab above Hyperion when they were actually attacked. This is the planet. Um, we missed that point. Yeah, sorry, but we missed she's a real. Detail. Tiny detail. She, 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 <laughs> is, she is real, John. I don't get. I I didn't. I didn't believe it I was a little skeptical but then everything comes in everything crystallizes and you can if you want to tell this last part because it's important we can she's real and because all these elements of time and time travel all crystallize and so uh, what is 
What is she, John? Right. So, well, I don't know what she is. I can take a guess. But the important, the important thing to take away from this part of the story, regardless of anything else, is that Colonel Kassad has actually been in the Time Tombs or to the Time Tombs and come out alive, unlike anybody else. Okay? Um, so he sees her. She says your enemies are approaching. You kind of assume she means the Ousters and they're landing ships on the planet near where he crashed. She takes him to the Time Tombs and they describe this force field being there that no one can really get through. She takes him through it. And then while they're in there, they, they get kind of cozy with each other. And uh, and then he's, you get these really awesome descriptions of these chromium shields going around them and these these reflections. And then they they start moving, I think that was they were floating almost, and they, they start moving through this desertous area, and then they see the Shrike. And he's with her. Dun, 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 dun. And you see the Shrike. And then you see the Ousters, and she she and the Shrike take him to where the Ousters have landed to get him. Shrike sighting. Exactly. And then, exactly. It's like, Shrike! So, this is where... This is where it gets really weird because you realize that this woman is either a Shrike herself or she is part of the Shrike and the Shrike can split itself off. Or, But basically he's been getting cozy with the Shrike. So, and that kind of was freaky. But um, <laughs> they go they go through and, and he, you, you hear how the Shrike is able to move through time. Basically, they slow down time and they slaughter the Ousters in... in slow motion pretty much. They're moving at super speed to the ousters, but really all they're doing is moving in time. And they slaughter. It was a bloodbath. And then immediately after, they they get cozy again, which is the history of, uh, <laughs> of Kassad and this woman, but it turns into a terrible nightmare uh, at, at the end of that. And um, Kassad realizes then, because she, as they're doing what they do, she starts turning back into her true shape, which is a Shrike. Um, and you know, he's, he's kind of conflicted. You're right. This is the end here where it's like he's loved her. This has been his lifelong obsession, and it's changing right before his eyes. And it's that, and, and then the Code of Bushido, which was completely thrown out the window here, when you, they could stand still in time, or all their enemies are standing still in time, they can completely destroy them. But then his, his feelings change. He's in the bloodlust. Then they just kind of are moving slower, and he feels... He doesn't feel as bad about destroying his enemies, even though he has a superior technological advantage. And it is a technology. And the Shrike, we, we see we see kind of maybe he's not this omniscient being. And and I loved it because it's a, a direct, it's, it's, it's kind of very different from the Peter Dore experience, the Catholic priest. So I love Dan Simmons showing that perspective and then the labyrinthine perspective and then the fact that maybe he's a technologically superior alien and then he has followers, he's moving through time, and who knows where we're going to go, but... Well, now, I, I have to ask you this question real quick. Did you pick up on the fact that there's an interstellar war coming because the Ousters are almost upon Hyperion, and when you when you switch back to the Pilgrims, after Kassad's done telling his story, they say, do you think the Shrike is trying to use you to start an interstellar war? And he says yes, and I... You know, I get it. I read it. I, under, I comprehended it, but I'm I'm not really sure why the Shrike wants to start an interstellar war. Well, Except there's there some pretty clear language. It was he's, the, it's like uh, what is it, Galacticus, who's but, a world but, eater but in the Marvel that's, universe. That's he's, not, he's a that's dead not the dealer. way it's operated. That's not the way it's operated up to this point. Because I mean, I I get the idea. It's visited other worlds, but an interstellar war is something you haven't seen from the Shrike yet. Yeah, I I know I know he's a death dealer. He is the Lord of Pain. But this, I don't know. I it seemed like that wasn't the Shrike's way of of dealing death. Starting an interstellar war, the Shrike wanted to do the killing itself. A lot of times, it looked like. I guess I take yeah. I, I took it at face value that um yeah. Why does he need to uh, I guess set up this uh, ruse to to kill a lot of Ousters and let one escape to to take back a message? Maybe he wants people to the Ousters and the hegemony to wipe each other out. First, for some reason, because maybe he just he doesn't have the power to you know wipe out whole populations. He can wipe out segments of populations and make people disappear on his one world or wherever he's at. So maybe he's like cloak and dagger. He needs more. He needs more fresh bodies for the grinder. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, this, so we end up at the end with the the big <gasps> aha moment, like when we found out 
that Peter Hoyt was uh, actually infected with the with the cruciform. We find out that when uh, Kasai was on the planet, he saw the time tunes. We find out they're they're traveling backward in time. So the woman is telling him a lot of secrets. So the time tunes traveling backwards in time. He sees the the tr the tree of metal thorns. And when the story is over, his comrades ask him, did you see any of us on the tree? And yes, he did. He won't reveal who, and he only has one, in, one thing in mind. He plans to go back and not ask for anything from the Shrike. After 16 years off planet, he actually maybe has a plan to kill the Shrike. So this book is getting awesome, 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 just like the Lego movie, John. Everything is <laughs> awesome. And I cannot wait for the second part. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this edition. If you haven't read the book, you now know the first half. Read it for yourself. It's incredibly deep. We'll join you next week on the Random Books podcast. See you, John. All right. Take care.